Romans 8 and 28, very, very familiar passage of scripture that I know you're all familiar with. I want you to um, look at that and then we're just going to talk about this verses 28 um, to allow God to have his way. If you're there, say amen. amen. Come on, say it again. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Let me read it real quick. I'll be reading from the ESV. I know there's varying translations of this passage, but there's just um, a couple of things I want to share with you. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And for those who are called according to his purpose. Turn to your neighbor. We're going to say, neighbor, your steps are ordered by God. Yeah, turn to your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Your steps are ordered by God. Amen. I want to remind you of that this morning as we get ready to go into our summer um, and just this time of celebration and vacation and all that good stuff, that it's good to know that your steps are ordered by God. Anybody believe that this morning? Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Amen. Come on, don't fool me. Don't fool me. Yeah. Your steps are ordered by God. Let us pray, then we're going to go into the Word. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're gracious. Lord, you're kind. Lord, you're merciful. As I stand to teach, move Felix out of the way. Um, bring to remembrance everything that has been deposited, Lord. We want to just encourage people, just like you've reminded me uh, this week, that my steps are ordered by you. All of our steps are ordered by you. So we give you grace. We give you glory. We magnify and bless your name for who you are. So speak through me as I empty myself so you may fill me up. Let your word go forth mightily in this place. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. Come on, say it with me. Point to yourself. Say, self, my steps are ordered by God. I'm hoping that by the end of the message today, at least, that's my big idea. That's the thing I want you to understand and take away from here this morning, that you would see yourself in light of what God is doing. Here is me, right? One of my goals in life is I want to make sure that my kids and their children don't make the same mistakes that I made in life. Is that a fair statement? You kind of get what I'm saying? I, I, I say to my kids that I've been through, I've blown it, I've messed up enough for me and for all y'all. <laughs> right? So, so that, means, that means if you listen carefully to what I'm saying and you kind of pay attention as I try to be a good father and a good granddad and a good parent, you shouldn't have to go through what, what I go through. But most of us, we know kids, right? They want to have their own testimonies. Come on, y'all. They want to have their own, their own experience and encounter with God. And one of the ways I do that is that whenever opportunity presents itself, I will sit with my children and, and I will share them my failures. I would share with them the things that I did wrong, the lessons that I've learned. Um, and the interesting thing with my family is that the majority, if not all of my kids, are very entrepreneurial. So they're always trying to pull from me to get business ideas and business things. But at the same time, I'm trying to teach them character things. Are you hearing me? So that they can be who God would have us to be. Should I share? Uh, my oldest son in particular, he takes extreme advantage of that. That boy wants to know details. Dad, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? All that kind of, you kind of get where I'm going. But I share with them um, so they don't have to go through what I went through. Now, the interesting thing about what I'm sharing with you, I think the design of God is that for those of us that he has brought out of difficult situations, his expectation is that we share with others. Oh, I need an amen right there. That we share with others so that they know that if God brought you out and God brought me out, God can also bring them out. Come on, y'all. The problem with that, though, is that we come to God and we act like we hadn't done anything. We act like we've never had failures. We act as if we've never blown it. And so as a result, people are afraid or hesitant to come to faith with Christ because they look at the church and they see nothing but holy, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost people, and they don't know what to do with that because they, might, they assume, they falsely assume that we've been saved all our lives, right? I don't know about you, but when I look at the Bible, specifically the book of um, Hebrews chapter 12, here's what Hebrews 12 says. Seeing that we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witness, it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that's set before us, right? Most of us, when we quote that scripture or read that scripture, we only see it through spiritual eyes, but I want you to see it now through the lens of what I'm sharing with you in this introduction. Seeing that you've got a bunch of people who've blown it 
yet God used them. Learn from their, I wish I had somebody in here. You get it? Learn from their errors. Learn from their failures. Learn from their failings so you don't have to do the same thing. Here's what's striking about the Bible and all the biblical characters. To me, the Bible is filled with what I'm going to refer to as the providential intervention of God in the lives of just about every biblical character. And the goal of God in being involved in their life providentially is to draw them to a place where they know who he is and they could use him for his purposes. In other words, all of their steps were ordered by God. I want y'all to hear me say that. All of their steps were ordered by God. And that's what I really want us to take away this morning, that I want you to see that you too, your steps are being ordered by God because of the providence of God and the involvement of God in all of our lives. You've heard me talk about divine providence before. You've heard me share about what providence is. And in case you've missed that, let me redefine, and then we're going to talk about the text. Providence, the divine providence of God, is the involvement or the series of events that we go through in life. God uses that to prepare us for the next series of events that happens in our lives, all in preparation for us to be used by him. Okay? So here's what that means. Here's what that means. With God, nothing is accidental. Nothing is haphazard. Nothing happens for the sake of simply happening. God is ordering all of our steps. Come on, repeat out of me. Say, self. God is ordering my steps. You, you've heard me when I talk about providence, give you the illustration of Joseph, how Joseph's life was involved providentially and how God was involved in that. But today, let me give you another biblical character. And I think I can pick any character from the Bible and show you how God was involved in their life providentially. Come on, say Moses. Moses. If you were to look at the life of Moses just as an example to help you understand what divine providence is, then we're going to go to the text. Divine providence in the life of Moses looks like this. God allowing a Levite man to marry a woman from the tribe of Levi and give birth to a son that they called Moses. Okay? Divine providence also is Pharaoh now issuing this edict to kill every child two years and under, but God, by way of his providence, allowing Moses' mom, Miriam, to place Moses in a basket and place him in the night. Divine providence is also now Moses' mother allowing his sister Miriam to hide in the bushes and to watch her brother as he's hidden in the Nile to protect his life. Divine providence goes like this, God allowing Pharaoh's daughter to go to the very Nile to take a bath in the place where the baby was hidden such that she would see the child, come on, and be concerned about a Hebrew hiding the child. Divine providence is God having Miriam positions to watch Pharaoh's daughter find the child so she can emerge and says, I know a person who can watch that child. Y'all not hearing me. Divine providence also says that Miriam now going to Pharaoh's daughter and offering her services takes this baby and takes him to his very mother, y'all not hearing me, who birthed him and allowing her to raise him. Divine providence also is such that after the boy was at, was, became of age, his mother now hands him back to Pharaoh's daughter as if he were her own son. Here's the depth of divine providence. God now allowing Moses to be raised in the very house that he would end up having to go back and deliver. I wish I had somebody, his people from. Why? Divine providence says this. God wanted him to learn the language. God wanted him to learn the culture. God wanted him to learn the dress. Come on. God wanted him to learn the code. More importantly, God wanted him to have access to Pharaoh such that when the time was right, God would send him back to go to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. Divine providence. The reason I want to point that out, because left in isolation... These series of events may seem catastrophic. They could seem 
I, it, they could seem tough. They could seem devastating. They could seem as this difficult time in the life of Moses and his sister and his mother. But if we understand with God, he meticulously and intricately weaves all the events of our lives together such that they form this beautiful cord with us ended up serving him and doing what God would have us to do. You see, if you look at your life in isolation, you'll say, man, I blew it. But God would say, man, I was shaping you. Yeah. If I look at my life, I'd say, man, I messed up. But God would say, no, I was using that for this. I wish I had somebody in here. God orders our steps for his purpose. Turn to him and say, neighbor, God is ordering you. Now, as you look at the text that's in front of us, there's some Simple things I want to share with you this morning from the text because this text is what I would call the epitome of what divine providence is all about. And we know, we know the scripture quite well. Here's how we would quote it if we have to quote it. We would say, and we know that in all things God works for the good to them that love him and to those who are the called according to his purposes. But before we can get to the providential part of the text, there's two prerequisites that we need to look at. Number one, we have to see that what I'm sharing with you applies specifically to a category of people that have two critical character traits. Come on, say two traits. Two traits. Number one, they must love God. Say, you must love God. And number two, you must be called by God. Say, I must be called by God. Two things, you must love him and you must be called by him. So as we look at the text, the first thing I want you to see is that divine providence now is at work in the lives of everyone who say they love God, okay? Now, it says, all things work together for good to those who love God and who are the call according to his purpose. Here's what I wanted to see what love is. When it talks about love, it talks about that Greek word agapeia, which simply speaks to, for simplicity's sake, Christian love or an active love that says that God and I are in a relationship. Now, here's the interesting thing about that word love, right? It's written in the present tense, which means it's something that's happening now and they have no, no assessment of the completion of the thing. So here's what, here's what that means. You can't be in a place where you say, I used to love God, but now I don't love him. Oh, come on, y'all. You, you can't be in a place where you're doing your own thing. Oh, are you hearing me? But the love of God speaks to an active uh, involvement that my relationship with him is where I ought to be right now. So here's what it looks like. My love for God, two things, is demonstrated by my commitment to God. So here it is. Repeat out of me. Say, I must be committed to God. Say it again. Say, I must be committed to God. If you were to go to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, here's what they would say, right? Their devotion that says when the Spirit came upon them, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. They were devoted to prayer. And you hear the things that God was doing as a result of them. There must be a devotion and or a commitment to God. Now listen to this. It doesn't always begin like that. This is where I'm going. But it ends up like that. Ah. It doesn't always begin like that, but it ends up like that, right? Here's the other thing, right? Is your love is demonstrated by your or by, by my obedience to God. So here's what that means. Listen to me carefully. If I love God and God tells me to do something, guess what ought to be? Yeah, you get it. You get it, right? So uh, th there's a level of following him where he says, if the command is to go make disciples, I ought to be about doing what God called me to do, right? If the command is about serving my brother or sister, I ought to be about what? Serving my brother. Come on, are you hearing me? If the command is that I love my neighbor as myself, I ought to be about what? Loving my neighbor as, my, as myself. So number one, for providence to really manifest itself in the fullest extent, there's got to be a love for God. Say number one, say I must love God. 
if I were to illustrate with my lovely wife, I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my grandchildren. Now, here's the deal. I cannot say I love them, but they never see my love demonstrated toward them. Are you hearing me? Otherwise, I'm just breathing air, saying words, but my action does not align with what I say I'm about. We ought to be careful. We ought to be careful. And we want to be careful to make sure that in our love for God, it's not a said love. It's a demonstrated love. Does that make sense? Come on, repeat. Say, self. I must love God. Here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. I won't be before you long. The second thing is this. Divine providence is now at work in the lives of those who are called by God. Come on, repeat after me. Say, I must be called by God. Now, this is going to mess you up. This is going to mess you up because this is where I want to do some of the work, and I want you to understand divine providence. Here's what we do. In church, I need to come down here. We wait until we get saved, and then we say, I'm called. I'm going to let that settle because y'all are going to get it in about five minutes. It's going to settle in, right? So here's what we do. We define calling as the voice of God saying, Derek, I need you to leave your home and go to a place that I'm going to show you. And there it comes and he says, Pastor, the Lord has called me. And then we, we get the ordination council together and we lay hands on him and we say, Go, brother, the Lord has calleth thee. <laughs> right? And for you and for me, calling begins after salvation. I want to ruffle your theology for a little while. And I want to challenge the truth and lock into this. If divine providence is true and my steps are ordered by God, I want to say this calling we receive from God is an effectual calling. And here was that means. It began before you even showed up on the face of the earth. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Why are you saying that, preacher? You know scripture. Before the foundations of the world, I knew you and I ordained you to be. You kind of get what I'm saying. So here's the thing. The reason you showed up and the reason I showed up and the reason we're now on the face of the earth is not because later on God's going to figure out what he's going to do with you and what he's going to do with me. Before he released you, he had predefined purpose. I wish I had somebody in here. So when he sent you in the world, the call was already on. On your life. You got to get this. And the issue is, it's not him. The issue is the fact that I was not listening to him. I was not aware of the call. And so I fooled myself into doing my own thing, missing the voice of God. So in my infancy, I played games. I did things. I averted the spirit. And here's what God said, it's all good. Do you. You're going to hear me. Are you hearing me? And so I'd do me, and I'd bump my head into something, and he'd say, it's cool. I'm going to work that out for my good. Y'all not. Why? Because I've called you. You kind of get what I'm saying? And then we go through life with all its challenges. You kind of get where I'm going with this, right? And so here's what calls look. As, as we continue to live life, we end up hearing the voice of God in time, and we start, we begin the process of responding. I think I'm comfortable in saying this. All of you in here that are here under the sound of my voice, excuse the grammar, nay, one of y'all was born saved. And the reason you stopped your shucking and jiving is because you had enough sense in time to start hearing the sound of the voice of God. And the sound is what drew you to him. So it wasn't like he started calling you after you got saved. The reason you are saved is because you heard his voice. I wish I had somebody in here in the mess and in the sin. Then you heard. 
And then lock into this. Remember I said in the first point, you didn't all, we didn't always love him. And the more we listen, listen to this, the more the love grows. The more we listen, the more the love grows. And the more we listen, the more the love grows. I've been married to Katani a, a long, long time. And when I first met her, she, she didn't like her brother much. <laughs> and I kept calling her name, Katani. And she, boy, leave me alone. Go get a job, go do something. And I'd pursue her, Katani. Right? And she keeps shooing me off. I'd be like, Katani. And I kept calling her long enough that one day she said, what you want? That's what we do with God. Come on, y'all. What you want? And then one day she saw this sweet, dark looking, tasted that chocolate. She's like, man, the store don't sell nothing like you. Boy, where you been all my life? Girl, I've been calling you all your life. You just wasn't listening. <laughs> you kind of get where I'm You see what I'm saying? And watch this. And over time, listen to me, the love grew deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Now she can't breathe without looking at me. <laughs> yeah. The best thing that ever happened was the cell phone. Yeah, she, she pulling out the driveway. What you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you kind of get where I'm going? She driving out and still in the neighborhood. You gone, you leave. What you doing? I mean, ho -ho, every five minutes, girl, I know you love a brother, but I've been calling you all your life. And, and I want you all to hear me say, I'm using an illustration so you can understand. That's the way it works with God. When he first started calling us, we weren't cognizant of him because we weren't positioned to recognize who he was. He didn't start calling you after you got saved. He didn't start calling you when you came to church. He was calling you from the time we were shucking and jiving and doing all the crazy stuff we were doing on the face of the earth. He was always calling your name. Y'all don't believe me. Look at verse 30. Look at verse, look at verse 30, look at verse 30. Let me, let me, let me, let me put this up here. Look at, look at verse 30. Y'all know these words, y'all know these words. And, and you thought these words were only applicable after you got saved, right? No, 29. For those he, what's that word? Foreknew. He what? To be conformed to the what? Image of his son. You guys are there? In order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those he predestined, he what? He called and those he called, he also what? And those he justified, he also what? Notice what the text does not say. The text does not say some of them that he called, he justified. Some of them that he called, he glorified. Or some of them that he called. Every person that he called. Let me tell you how this worked. When I first met this young lady, I think I was playing basketball, just got through with a game. And she showed up on the base where I was. I was all sweaty. I was all, you know, doing my stuff. And I saw her and I was with my roommate. I said, dude, that's going to be my wife. I predestined her. You kind of get where I'm going? Why? Because I foreknew. I'm using an illustration here. And then in time, I called her Katani. Yeah, you kind of get it. And then the justification take place. And then the glorification, she got that ring on. Here's what foreknowledge is. He knew us in the womb, and I'm going to go as far as to say Jeremiah 1, before the womb, right? And because of that, he predestined us. So he called you before you were even born. Look at the next thing. And then not only that, it says here, behold, I stand at the door and knock in Revelation. He called, well, he chose us before the foundations of the world. Then he called us. And then he justified us. Here's what justified means. He cleaned us up so he could use us. Oh, my gosh. He cleans us up so he could use us. And then look at the last thing. And then he says, we shall be like him. He glorifies us. So what you see right now is not what it's always going to be. I'm going to be better. Are you with me? So, so lock into this. Because I love God, because he called me, and he's been calling me all my life, now look at the third thing, and then we're going to wrap this up. Here's the third thing, right? 
His providence draws me to him so now he can equip me, listen to this, for the ministry assignment. You guys are tracking with me. Okay? So look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. Notice what it says here. And then we're going to wrap this up. It says in verse 28, look at verse 28 carefully. And we know, for those who love God, all things work together. Repeat after me. Say all things. things. No, you got to believe that. Say it like you be. Say all things. things. Everybody say it again. Say all all things. Okay, now listen. I'm not saying some things. All of it. Because I would like to hope he would forget that. Right? But he won't forget that because you're going to see the that that he hopes you forget, that you hope he forgets, is part of the equipping for the ministry assignment. The problem is you'd like to forget it because you don't want the ministry assignment. They work together. together. Here's an interesting concept of that word work together. There's a Greek word, sunargai, right? Sunargeo is the Greek word. Here's what it means. It it means that it it takes two things to work synergistically or together to accomplish a means. The best illustration I can give you is this. And you've probably heard me use this before. If you're in a boat, a boat takes two oars for it to move in a straight line, right? Now, I need to row both oars together for the boat to move in the straight line, right? If all I do is row one oar, I will find myself going in a what? Perpetual circle, right? Life and God. Here's my problem and here's your problem. Pre us hearing the voice of God, we were turning one oar. Oh, and you wonder why the cycle of sin continued. You need to stop that. Well, the only way you can stop it is not you. You've got to start hearing the voice of God and add him to the equation and let him hold the other oar. And as God adds value to your life situations and circumstance, together... We make progress to get to where God would have us to go. Is this making sense? Are you hearing me? Say, it works together. It works together. together. Now, lock into this. It says it works together for good. And I like the text because the text doesn't say it works together for my good or for your good. It works together for whose good? For God's good. Come on, say God's good. God's good. That's very, very important because here's what I love about what when I understand the principle and the concept of this text, right? Where I thought I may have blown it, God uses that to equip me for what he ultimately wants me to do. Where you thought that that marriage would have ended everything that God wanted to do to you, God uses that to equip you. Where you thought the the, the sin, the failing, you, you went to jail and you thought, man, it's over. No, 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 no. God uses that for the equipping where you thought, man, I was strung out on drugs. No, 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 no. God can't use that. He uses it for the equipping. Y'all don't believe me yet. Remember Moses? Here's divine providence. Divine providence is this. God allowing Moses while living in Pharaoh's house to see an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Divine providence is Moses going in to rescue the the Hebrew by killing the Egyptian. Divine providence is, because he committed murder. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Divine providence is Pharaoh now issuing a wanted dead or alive poster for Moses. Divine providence is Moses now going on the run in the wilderness for 40 years. Divine providence is when he finds himself in the wilderness, he would encounter this man by the name of Jethro who would teach him to listen to the voice of God. Y'all not hearing me. Divine providence is him marrying Jethro's daughter, Zephora, and then he'd end up tending Jethro's sheep. Divine providence is God causing Moses now to be in the wilderness, taking care of the sheep so he can light a bush that would be on fire and the bush would not consume him. Divine 
divine providence is God allowing all that stuff to happen to position Moses in the bush so when he calls him and sends him back, Moses would have all the equipping that he needed to go back to the house of Pharaoh to say to him, let my people go. You need to hear me say this. The reason God allowed you to go through and the reason God brought you out was not for the sake of bringing you out. Now he expects that you go back in because somebody needs deliverance. So he let you steal so you can tell somebody, don't do it. Come on, he let you commit the crime so now you can tell somebody, don't do it. He let you fail so you can tell somebody, y'all not hearing me, but we come and we act like we hadn't done nothing. Holy sanctified. I can't let the saints know my story, but God knows it. And he called you while you were doing it. If he let Moses commit murder so he can get trained, so he can go back in, who in the heck do you think you are? Are you hearing me? Listen, church, the world is waiting on the people of God to tell someone else that my steps have been ordered by God. And you can encourage them in their worst nightmare that their steps are ordered by God. And here's what you say. Look at me. Come on, y'all. Be honest with me. Look at me, right? If I can make it, you can make it. Right? And the whole premise of the truth of Romans 8 and 28 doesn't matter what the difficulty is. It doesn't matter what the challenge was. It doesn't matter what the stronghold was. It does not define you. God's call on your life tells you who you are. Are you hearing me? And I'm going to end with this. And we were created for more. Are you hearing me? We were created for more. We were created for more. Here's what some of us do. I done did time. God can't use me. I done sinned. God can't use me. I've done this and God can't use me. You get what I'm saying? And we restrict the call of God solely to the people who sit on the front row or the people who are up here or the people who are administering. Last I checked, I don't remember seeing David standing in a pulpit preaching a message. (laughs) Tell me he wasn't called. Does this make sense to you all? Are you hearing me? Your steps are ordered by God, don't let no one tell you otherwise. Be who God would have you to be. Are you hearing me? Come on, bow your heads with me. Come on, say amen. Come on, stand to your feet. Just come on, worship. I really want us to reckon with this this morning because sometimes we miss the move of God because of who we are and we don't think God could use us. Father, in the name of Jesus. Somebody's here who may have blown it. Somebody's here who may be feeling less than. Somebody's here who is feeling as if God can't use them in this moment. Someone is here, Lord. And I'm praying that this word has revived them, has brought life to them, has rekindled a flame to let them know that they're called by you and their steps are ordered by you. So as your word has gone forth this morning, If there's one, draw them, God. If there's one that's been avoiding you, draw them, God. If there's one that has not as of yet said yes to you, draw them, God. Move mightily in this place as only you can move. We give this to you, God, that your presence permeate this house. Fill this place, God. In your name we pray.